the Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art ever present, filling all things, treasury of blessings, giver of life. Come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. Christ is in our midst. He is in our midst. All right, so this evening uh, we're going to hear from Cindy on, a, on a, uh, another very important father, a figure of the, uh, of the church, uh, St. Irenaeus, in the um, Anti Nicene Fathers uh, series uh, published by Erdmans way back in the late 19th century. Um, the introduction to uh, St. Irenaeus's works, I have it here, this is what it looks like. Anti, but it, it's spelled with an E, not an I. Pre. So it means the, uh, yeah, the pre Nicene fathers. Nicene, Nicene refers to the Council of Nicaea, the first ecumenical council in 325, held what? 13 years after uh, the Christian faith was legalized and Constantine had his vision on the Golden Bridge and was um, converted. He was not baptized until his deathbed, but um, he uh, stopped the persecutions that had been going on sporadically in the Roman Empire and uh, legalized, well, he, did he, legal, uh, he legalize it? And I think it was saying as of Emperor Theodosius in the 380s who made it the, 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 the state religion. Um, so um, that was the Council of Nicaea. So uh, this is, uh, the, 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 this fellow is calling, in his introduction to St. Irenaeus, he's calling him the first father of the church, the first of the Holy Fathers of the church. Uh, Cindy will tell us more about St. Irenaeus, for example, that, you know, when he, it's not, it's not altogether, it's not too far off, because St. Irenaeus is fairly, fairly early, um, he was a disciple, or he was, he may have been a student, he may have sat at the feet of the martyr Polycarp, so he was in the, he was in the second century, um, so he is right after the Apostolic Fathers, but, um, so this evening, uh, Cindy is going to present to us on St. Irenaeus, um, giving her about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you know she has, and then we'll have a little discussion. Um, you know, uh, let's let's pepper her with some good questions, uh, make her work. You know, um, and then uh, we'll see how it how it is at that time, and we might take a short break, three to five minutes, maybe to help me reset uh, and get a sense because I have some definite things that I want to uh, share with you this evening, but I'm hoping you do as well. Remember, the assignment tonight was to read the text, read the material, and then highlight uh, things, uh, passages that strike you. And then that can become the platform of our discussion this evening. So um, we do have uh, some individuals who are not able to make it this evening because of illness or some other, some other reason. So we are wanting to make sure that we upload this onto the YouTube so that they can watch later. Cindy, I'm going to give it to you now, and okay. we'll look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay. So, my version of this is a lot thicker, but I don't know if he has the complete set. There's five books in all. Um, so, St. Irenaeus. Yes, he was one of the early church fathers. He was born around 130 A.D., so he lived mainly in that second century. Uh, his parents were Christian, and he lived in the town of Smyrna in Asia Minor. He was uh, supposedly a student of Polycarp. I don't know how many of you know who Polycarp was. He was a famous bishop in Smyrna. Uh, he was a disciple, a student of um, St. John the Theologian, so one of the apostles. So uh, the, we can think of um, St. Irenaeus really, really being pretty darn close to the apostolic teachings himself. Uh, Polycarp was uh, martyred in Rome. He was attached to a metal chair, and they set a fire underneath it and burned him. And there was some very interesting things that were going on through that period, but yes, he did die. <laughs> uh, so anyway, St. Irenaeus says of Polycarp that he always taught the things which he had learned from the apostles and which the church has handed down. And this is really important. He's always talking in his writings and in his teaching about uh, how things, uh, the apostolic succession and tradition, how it is carefully 
being handed down. He really emphasizes this. Uh, Saint Irenaeus became a priest and somehow went from Asia Minor to Gaul or southern France and he his church was in the area of Lyon. <coughs> in uh, 177, he was sent to Rome with a letter to the Pope regarding the heresy of Montanism. And while he was in Rome, a persecution took place against the churches in the area of Lyon. And many parishioners were martyred, including the bishop. Upon his return, Irenaeus succeeded the martyred bishop to become the second bishop of Lyon, and he's thought to have died somewhere around 200 to 203. So really, that second century is where he focused, or where he lived. During his time as bishop, he focused on pastoring his flock. He also is known for encouraging missional work in the surrounding areas, going north into France, going into Germany and then writing as well. His most famous work, we know it as Against Heresies, but it has other titles. Father Paul was right. It's Against the Gnostics Falsely So-Called. Or another um, definition is On the t Detection and Overthrow of the So-Called Gnosis. Gnosis meaning knowledge. Another uh, interpretation or definition is a reproof and overthrow of the false knowledge. This uh, was written around 180 to refute the heretical teachings that had arisen and was drawing a lot of Christian believers away from the one true faith. These groups emphasized intellectual and spiritual knowledge and elevated this knowledge above the teachings, traditions, and authority of the church. St. Irenaeus's education in Greek philosophy and rhetoric equipped him to engage with and refute the Gnostic ideas systematically. He used philosophical arguments and his rhetorical skills to expose what he saw as the logical flaws and inconsistencies in the Gnostic teachings. The main, there were a lot of different groups, of Gnostics. Um, the main ones he was focused against were the Valentinians, the Marcosians, um, the Marcionites, uh, and let's see, Basilides, Isidore, and other sects. Uh, some of these were reported to have been followers of Simon the Magician uh, from back, uh, even during the Apostolic times. Irenaeus appears to be particularly well informed about Valentinian Gnosticism and he uses it as a primary example in his refutations. His work, one of the things he says later in the book is that other people that have tried to rebu provide rebuttals against the heretics didn't really understand what the Gnostics were doing. So that was one of the really important things that Irenaeus focused on is understanding their teachings, and then he outlines them in his first book. And what's really interesting is that as the church triumphed over Gnosticism, many of the Gnostic writings were destroyed. In fact, Against Heresies is one of the primary sources scholars had to understand what the Gnostics believed until they found the Nag Hammadi writings where they stored that. So that was the mid 20th century where those were found. Um, he, his, his writings, and part of the reason why he is one of the earliest church fathers or attributed to that is his writings contributed to the eventual development of the creed. It upheld the authority of the Episcopal church and it helped the church to do to develop an authoritative canon of scriptures. In one of his chapters, he goes and he's like, we could do this everywhere, but I'm gonna do it for Rome. And he did, he listed out, here was the first bishop, here's the second bishop, here's the third, da da da, all the way to his time. The other thing that I think is really important is he talks about there being four gospels. Okay, he's writing this around 180. We know that the Gospels were written 
in that first century, maybe in the 95 might have been when John finished his, the last of the four. Irenaeus gives his history of Mark, then Matthew, then Luke, then John. So we get a lot of history and background about the different people and what was going on. Um, the other thing that he does in his works is he relies heavily on scriptures. Um, one of the things um, that's really, really interesting, and it's not even in my paper, but <laughs> is uh. that um, I have heard various people say that if somehow all scripture was destroyed, the scriptural texts themselves, we could, using Irenaeus and other church fathers, we still have an enormous chunk of the Bible. It might not be laid out in the same way the books are today, but because they quoted from the books and referenced all these biblical passages, even if this is all we had, we still have enough to maintain the faith. I think that's really incredible. By the way, the Bible is the most numerous of all ancient documents there are, by the thousands. Some scholars um, in other ancient texts are lucky to have two copies, and we have 2,500 more than that. So, anyway, sideline, get back to the paper. So, Against Heresies is considered one of the most early important Christian works. It provides valuable insights into the Gnostic beliefs of the time, and it played a crucial role in defining Orthodox Christian doctrine in the face of these heretical challenges. Irenaeus' work remains a model for Christian apologetics, demonstrating the importance of understanding opposing views thoroughly while firmly grounding arguments in scripture and logical reasoning. So the theological being addressed in his writings it's, again, to refute the teachings of these so-called Gnostic groups. Apparently, there were several Greek merchants uh, in the area of Lyon that had begun an oratorial campaign that was teaching that the material world was an accidental creation of an evil god uh, from which we're to escape by pursuing gnosis, knowledge, secret knowledge especially. Due to the failure of other apologists to address the issue, St. Irenaeus took it upon himself to study the Gnostic teachings and write refutations that could aid the church in its defense against them. So his writing was intended to go out to all the other churches to help them rebut their antagonists. Um, the Orthodox doctrine of creation ex nihilo Articulated by St. Irenaeus, uh, emphasizes God's sovereignty, the goodness of creation, and it's the continuity of the New Testament with the Old Testament. This stood in stark contrast to the Gnostic teachings that devalued the material world, separated the Creator from the Supreme Being, and um, also distinguished the evil God of the Old Testament with the good God of the New Testament. Hmm, isn't it interesting? We have some Christian churches that believe that to this day. Um, St. Irenaeus contended with the Gnostics because they were deriving the foundational principles of their doctrine from a variety of philosophers <coughs> of the day. Instead of using scripture and the apostolic teachings, the Gnostics assigned significant meaning to um, numerical systems. They would say there was this, um, they did have the concept of uh, a God that is not knowable, divine and out there. But they also had him like just out there, not engaged with the world. He had these emanations and from them a series of Godlings were created, eons or aeons. Uh, and, it, and a lot of times they would be in pairs, a male and a female, and a male and a female. And there was like a foursome, and they were called something. And then there was 12 of them, and that was something. And then there's 30 of them, and that was something. They go into all this numerology, and so then one of the things that they do is <laughs> they pull Bible passages that say something about 12, 
to argue their point that what this really means is our 12 eons and what this is. So they really wound up using scripture uh, in an atomistic way, twisting isolated words and phrases to support their preconceived ideas, and disregarded the holistic testimony of the biblical writers. They failed to recognize the authorial intent of what was written in the Bible, as well as the biblical context of those writers. They're selectively parsing out meanings from parables um, that didn't relate to the actual intended meaning of even the Lord's instructions in his parables. Uh, St. Irenaeus insisted that biblical passages must be interpreted within their context and in harmony, in harmony with the rest of scripture. You can't just pick out the different parts and pieces that you like. A quote that from St. Irenaeus is, the method which these men employ to deceive themselves while they abuse the scriptures by endeavoring to support their own system out of it. So they're, again, picking and choosing what they like, what they find is useful. And so although there was a multitude of Gnostic groups with different beliefs, in general the Gnostic cosmology, uh, cosmogony uh, presents a distinguish, like I said, it distinguishes between the supreme uncreated hidden God who is completely separate from and in, uninvolved in material creation and a series of lesser divinities. One or more of these beings uh, will often be referred to as the Demiurge, and this being became distorted or evil, and it is that being that's responsible for creating the material universe. This is how they explain evil and sin in the world. And they wanted to totally separate and divorce God, the divine God, from evil, and this is how they chose to do it, by saying, oh, it wasn't him that did material creation, it's this other, other person that's flawed and evil. So where the church believed that God can be understood through um, revelation and creation, the Gnostics believed that the divine is unknowable except through secret gnosis. Early Gnostic teachers such as Val Valentinian saw their beliefs as aligned with Christianity, believing that Christ was one of those divine beings one of those eons, who came to lead humanity back to the recognition of the, their, the spark of divinity within them. So they would talk about Jesus, but they would also talk about Christ, and they would also talk about the Savior, as if they're different eons. Um, they would talk about, at Christ's baptism, when the Spirit comes down, that is when the incarnation happens. That's when the spirit takes over the human. But it also departs before the crucifixion. So it's never the <coughs> God-man that is doing all the things that Jesus did. So um, just a summary of Against Heresy, book one. Irenaeus is providing a recap of all the teachings of the multiple Gnostic leaders. And let me tell you, this is confusing. It's like going around in circles. I mean, and he repeat, it seems like he's repeating stuff, but it's, he's telling each school, but not necessarily in a nice order that we would like in our world. So I found that one of the hardest chapter, books to read. Um, and then in book two, he attempts to provide proof that Valentinianism contains no merit in terms of its doctrine. He rebuts the Gnostic system using philosophical arguments rather than employing scripture, and he points out how the Gnostic teachings are internally inconsistent, contradictory, and logically flawed. So this, he's using their own ways of t talking and their own ways of thinking in his first effort to rebut them. In book three, Irenaeus shows that the doctrines are false by providing counter evidence that he's pulling from the apostolic teachings as preserved in the four gospels. And again, I just think it's so cool that he's talking about scripture. He's talking about not only um, the four gospels, but also the, uh, the epistles. I mean, the Bible really is 
coming together and known and in the hands of somebody in Lyon, not just where it was written in the, um, in the Levant, in Palestine and, and Asia Minor. Uh, so he spends the first four chapters of book three proving that the Orthodox scriptures are the only dependable authority of true apostolic teachings. He's able to provide lists of apostolic successors in Rome as proof of its argument. And again, he says, I can give you more lists if you want them. I'm just giving you one as a sample. The remainder of the book is dedicated to how the apostolic writings disprove Gnostic doctrines. And what's interesting is that St. Irenaeus is employing a Christological argument. So Christology is already here, already present. I mean, it was even present in Paul, for that matter. But he says, you know, scripture proves that Christ is God, that there's only one God, and that both the scriptures and the apostles attest to the existence of that one true God. The clear implication is that the scriptures disallow there being numerous divine beings, and none of them could have created the physical cosmos. St. Irenaeus uses scriptural-based arguments to prove that orthodox doctrine is correct and that the Gnostics are the innovators. He's not only, when he's pulling arguments, he's not only pulling them from the gospel, he's also pulling from the Old Testament. Now, book four, he focuses on Jesus' sayings in particular, and here uh, St. Irenaeus also addresses the unity of the Old, uh, Old Testament with the New Testament. He demonstrates that the God of the Old Testament is the same God that's in the New Testament. In book five, he focuses more on sayings of Jesus, but he also includes letters of Paul. Um, Irenaeus develops a recapitulation theory of atonement, suggesting that all aspects of Jesus' life, including his suffering, are crucial for human salvation. This counters Gnostic views that downplayed Christ's physical existence. Um, and again, like I said before, they would often parse the names and titles of Christ into separate persons. Uh, the Gnostics denied the Orthodox belief that Jesus was both man and God, and that as both he suffered and died. The Gnostic view tended to emphasize Christ's divinity at the expense of his humanity, seeing him as a spiritual revealer rather than a physical redeemer. This contrasted sharply with Orthodox insistent on Christ's full humanity and bodily incarnation. St. Irenaeus argues that creation is good and destined for glorification unlike the Gnostics who viewed the material world as flawed and some place to be escaped from. He provides a defense of physical resurrection and concept of eternal judgment. So that's also really interesting, the last part he's really focused in on, on some of the, the eschatology, the end times. In his book, St. Irenaeus uses... Um, or develops this thing called a canon of truth, also called a rule of faith. And that refers uh, to a summary of core Christian doctrines that he used as a standard for orthodox belief and interpretation of scripture. The canon of truth is a concise summary of essential Christian doctrines as taught by the apostles. It's used as a criterion for discerning orthodox teaching as opposed to heresy. It's associated with baptism and passed down orally or in writing, and it's a hermeneutical standard for properly interpreting Christian faith. The canon includes core beliefs such as one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, one Christ, Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, the Holy Spirit, the virgin birth, passion, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, and Christ's future return. In essence, the creed. It's got its seeds right here. St. Irenaeus' canon of truth was important because it provided an objective measure of orthodoxy. It was based on apostolic teachings as preserved in the churches. And one of the things he also touts is that it doesn't matter where the church is, we're all doing the same thing. It's universal. It's all the same. It doesn't matter if you're here or if you're in Antioch or if you're in Jerusalem, it's all the same. St. Irenaeus saw the canon of truth as based on 
and consistent with scripture. It was a tool for preserving orthodox interpretation of scripture and identical in content to scripture and apostolic tradition. The canon of truth was Irenaeus's way of articulating the core apostolic teachings found in scripture and as a standard for orthodoxy and proper biblical interpretation. It was not seen as separate from or above scripture, but as a faithful summary of <coughs> scriptural doctrine. Ta-da. I did it. Thank you, Cindy. Anybody have questions for Cindy? Yes. Okay, question. Um, you said that they found um, original copies of Gnostic texts in the 20th century. Yeah, at Nag Hammadi. Um, how did those, the writings of those compare to what St. Irenaeus there. Scholars have um, different debates, but most of the time it was in alignment with, but not identical to what they were writing. So they got, I would say, um, they could better understand what Irenaeus was saying by reading things. And we're talking like the Gospel of Thomas as one of those writings. Yes? Yeah, you mentioned that you were talking about uh, this um, heresy about the creator of the material or the <coughs> evil and, uh, and, the, and God in the New Testament being the good, the good guy. Yeah. And you, you mentioned that uh, there's Christians that believe that today. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can give me a couple examples. Because I know there's Christians that are kind of influenced or kind of you know, negative on the, the Old Testament. And, but um, I've never heard anybody anybody that's a Christian out come right out and say, oh, the creator of the world is, is evil. I never, that would be too obviously bizarre. Right. And I don't think they're effect. saying that so much as they're saying that the, that the God of the Old Testament is angry. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, and, right. and it has to do with the penal substitutionary atonement for, you know, God is mad and that's why Jesus yeah. came to take the punishment. And so it's not so much that God as creator is evil, so much as the God of the Old Testament is a crabby, mean person and not the same as the nice Jesus who is forgiving and all of that. So it's, it's that, the diametric um, yeah, yeah. distinctions between the Old and the New Testament. Does this evil demiurge, does that go into Manichaeanism? Is this related? Yes, yes it is. There are. Yes. The evil is it like the what, same heresy? What did you say? What? This is like evil demiurge. This, uh, does he? Is that like the uh, Manichaean evil yes. entity? Yes. Is it the same thing? Is this like a, just a straight continuation? Yeah. yeah. All kinds of different dualisms and Gnosticism. Yeah. Some of them drawing from uh, Zoroastrianism. Those are the Iranian type of the Gnostics. Zoroastrian. Gnostics. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they draw from Zoroastrianism. Others it's... draw from uh, uh, the Far East, the, the, the Assyrian. They're called the the Syrian type of Gnostics. Um, so I was going to say to your point, Cindy, that it, 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 uh, I think you did, you did well to uh, um, uh, nuance the, um, the, the understanding of Scripture that prevails in my, many so-called Christian churches. It's, it's not like there's so much different gods, it's that they're, but basically what you have is you have God the Father in the Old Testament, who's the angry guy, and you have the Son in the New Testament who appeases the Father. But in orthodoxy, the God who appears to all the uh, patriarchs is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's not yeah. anger so much as it's... Not just the, the God who um, is angry, but also the God whose initial good plan fell apart. And so Jesus is the uh, plan B mm. that will come in and fix it. Yes, yeah. yes. And it's like, that's not how Which God... Puts the world in charge. Yeah. <laughs> that's an interesting point. Yeah. Yep. So in orthodoxy, there is no plan B. No. no. Not really. No, there isn't. There's no. only one plan. And, and no, the creator of God is still working. working it out. And you can see that plan in the first chapter of Genesis. Yeah. In fact, you can see it in the first two verses of Genesis. Anyway, that gets us to something.
Well, see, the, uh, the, the quote of Irenaeus that sticks in my mind is, the glory of God is a human being fully developed. There's, some, God, there's many ways of translating what that, what that fully realized state is, yep. but it's very material, incarnational, anti-Gnostic, and also anti-dualist, anti mm -hmm. which yep. is fascinating. Yeah. Yes. So I have a question relating to praxis. So if you're a Gnostic and you believe that everything is about Gnosis, your secret knowledge, what sort of praxis did they have? And what was Irenaeus' rebuttal of that praxis if there wasn't? You know, it was, I don't know about what practices. He didn't really go into that. He was much more talking about their logical arguments yeah. and how they're, they're just... You can't believe that. How could you believe that this lesser being is going to be able to do this and that and the other thing when that means that this wouldn't happen and this couldn't happen and these other things wouldn't, be, you know, it's like the only person that could create is the top dude. And so he just goes on to that. It's um, not always easy to read, but... Um, and aren't most, uh, most New Age cults and teachings, I think, are, are direct lineal yeah. descendants of Gnostics. And all those esoteric teachings, these yes. unique little practices and mindfulness, and I don't know, whatever the secret yeah. gnosis is. Do yoga and repeat different things. It's going to take care of everything. The whole psychedelic thing, yeah. very, it really, really goes into that. Yeah, and, and, and again, even the, you know, like the Plato and some of the stuff that he talks about, you know, trying to get beyond, find that divine spark and, and escape. It's all about escaping this world, which, again, is still pretty prevalent. Yeah. This divine spark business, is this, because uh, God breathes life into us, is this, uh, I mean, these, they sound similar. Is there any difference? Or distinctive, we can. It it has to do the way I understand it is you know there's these successions of eons and then these guys had more and these guys had more. So they're being degraded as they and, go along. Yes, and eventually you get to man, and they talk about an animal nature versus a spiritual nature versus uh there's like three different natures and I couldn't understand the third. It's also one. confusing. Yeah, so it was just going on and on about it's a degradation. Yeah. I was just going to um, have a suggestion for um, Aesiel Sawyer uh, that, uh, you know, according to the practices, there's like two schools, basically. There's one school that's like, you got to be really super spiritual and renounce everything in the world because they're all creations from the, you know, is evil. And then the other one basically says, well, creation is worthless and doesn't matter, so you can do whatever you want and you can... Do anything you want and go out, and so so they had to either live it up or totally renounce the yeah. world. two extremes kind of. of it. So Michael, where did you learn that? Uh, I don't remember. You sound like a <laughs> student of Gnosticism. <laughs> I, I looked into it. Yeah. Did you? A little bit. Okay. I I, I don't know if I ever was fully a but you Gnostic, know, but. I, the, but even being a Calvinist is somewhat Gnostic. So. Uh, the um, uh, analogy with New Age helps you to understand Gnosticism. It's just like there's all kinds of New Ages. There's, is there a New Age tradition? Is there a New Age group? There's just like there's just a mindset that this that uh, they have a certain mindset, and uh, you can belong. You can call yourself New Age, but. They're perhaps you know there's there's countless sects of New Age and they have they each have their different own, their own proxies, um, and you can say, so you know you say that the fundamental quality of Gnosticism was um, that this world is evil, and there's a um, the God who created or the God that we are all part of um, is not known. That's why it requires divine revelation. But what saves you is this knowledge. This knowledge. 
that you belong, that you are this, that, that, that you are of the, of the God, the unknown God. Yep, and so that's where they gave that role to Jesus in that he communicated that so that you can recognize that piece of divineness sure. in you. Not what he died and did all the things that we believe for salvation, but that he was teaching these truths. Were you the one who said it in your paper? He was a revealer. He's yes. not a savior. He's a revealer. Yes. He's a messenger. Um, and you, your reference to Calvinism, I don't think that's too far off because, um, you know, if you're if you're one of the one one of, one of the you know, if you're one of those who belongs to this God, but you're like one of the elect, then when the messenger comes, you recognize him. You know, it's not unlike the doctrine of predestination. If you're one of the elect, then when the mess when the when the preaching is given, you respond. The critic Alan Bloom says that American culture has shot through the Gnosticism, Interesting. starting right with the Puritan thing. Interesting. They're leaving the evil European world behind. They're coming here to start in a new, fresh, blank slate, you know, yeah. pure world, and they're going to have you know, the Puritans. They're going to yeah. make everything pure. And he says that goes right straight through into the Transcendentalists, Ralph Waldo Emerson, sure, sure. and all those folks. And it's, uh, it's deep in American sensibility. You know, it sounds bizarre, doesn't it? It sounds bizarre. But familiar. <laughs> Until you realize, you know, that, um, like what you're saying, um, we're, lit, we're swimming in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it, is, it has influenced so many of the, of the memes, the thought forms of our, of our country. I want to quickly add, uh, uh, speak to your point, Paul. Um, you said that the, you were talking about the divine spark and how this, or, or something, how this sounds very really familiar, like something we would say, or yeah. to, to that effect. Listen to this. This is in uh, Irenaeus's preface to Book One. He says, um, "The Lord has enjoined us to be on our guard because their language resembles ours, while their sentiments are very different." So yes. You can read some of these Gnostics, and you say, wait, whoa, whoa, that sounds awfully orthodox. But the sentiment of what's underneath it is quite different. Travis? Just to speak to what things underneath, I remember when I was reading the Gospel of Thomas when I was six, yeah. one of the things that it mentioned was that they believed that not everyone had a divine spark. Huh? Uh, they, they didn't think that everyone had a soul that could be saved. It was only those people who were... Yes. Truly so were they like subhuman? Like yes. there's like the master class, almost Nietzschean. Like there's the the Ubermensch with the spark, and then yeah. all the yeah. um, people of clay or whatever. Yeah, so, so that wouldn't be called necessarily Gnosticism, but Dave, would you agree that's Gnostic-like? Mm -hmm. What he just said. Yeah. So you they see, it, it sounds bizarre until you start uh, re, um, thinking through some of these philosophers that we've been reading. You realize that. You know, there's a spirit. Gnosticism is a spirit. It's not just a doctrine. But there, there are all kinds of different doctrines. That's why Cindy was so bored reading book <laughs> one. He's going through all the different... Then these are just the Gnostics in Lyon. <laughs> um, so it's not so much... I mean, there, there are some fundamental tenets, like the, uh, you know, the evil God is the one who created this world. Um, and so that, that leads to the, different, the, two, the two different kinds of practices. But um, uh, beyond that, it, it's more of a spirit, it's more of a mindset. Isn't that, isn't it? Maybe a basic question, but these heretics, were they starting their <coughs> own churches and calling them Christian, or were they trying to infiltrate the, the church? And I think China? both. Would you say, Cindy? Yeah. Both. That's Some of them were, you know, and like one of them, I, was it Marcion that um, he only yes. would accept Luke yeah. and Paul's letters? Yeah. Yeah. And so he was like half in, half out. Um, Do you remember what Marcion was? Was he a deacon? Was he a priest? Do you remember? I don't remember. But he was a Christian priest or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he was. He was um, so he cut out the Old Testament. Yeah. And then he cut out the parts of the Pauline epistles that he didn't like, right? Right, yeah. Think of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> I can think of Martin Luther. <laughs> yeah. So again, it, it's that it's a spirit. It's, it's a mindset. Yeah. 
but there was definitely, you know, these people would be in the public square and talking about their stuff and, and oh, wisdom and this and that and the other thing, and people were familiar with philosophy, and so then they just start, and it sounded really good, and, and so they were drawing people away from the true faith, which is why uh, St. Irenaeus uh, felt compelled to write. You know, I've, I've wondered if, if the pull of Gnosticism was more existential than it was dogmatic. I've wondered if it, I've wondered if it speaks to a person's feeling of disenfranchisement. Um, a, a person, you know, a person just kind of down and out, beat around by the world, or for whatever reason just angry. Um, this kind of system would speak to him, I would think. So I maybe wonder if it's a cultural, if it was, it speaks to the psychology of the culture as well as the psychology of the individual. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic. Um, so, thank you, Cindy. Anything else? That, you know, Cindy, I was going to ask you, um, if you could, to put you on the spot here, if you could distill what you took from your work on this and just to maybe one or two basic points. What, what, you, what did you draw, what, uh, come, away, come away with? Well, first of all, again, from a cultural studies aspect, I was so impressed with how much scripture he embedded, how much he knew, how much had been collected and percolated. That was really, because he's, and then how he puts it to use. But then I think also the reason why he's acknowledged as one of the, the first church fathers is his principles that he's putting down, that he's a starting to work on the creed, on the canon, and strongly affirming apostolic succession. I think those were those were the big things for me mm -hmm. that I was taking out of that. So now let's look at when he was living. He was living in the second century, yeah. 120, 130 to 200, 202. So this is the period of time when the church is uh, going out into the Hellenistic world. So you have Irenaeus, you have Justin Martyr, you have Athenagoras, you have um, uh, uh, Miletus, um, you have all of the apologists. Um, so there's this, um, there's, did I say Justin Martyr? Mm -hmm. um, was Tertullian then? He would have been in the early 3rd century. Okay. Um, so you have, so this is, you have, um, you have the church going out into the world. So Irenaeus is, is sent to Lyon. Uh, there, and I find that interesting because you know the centers of Christianity at this time of, uh, in, the, in the life of the church would have been um, Alexandria and Antioch and even Rome. So those would have been the three main centers. But really, the bit that the main activity was, or, you know, the centers would have been Alexandria and Antioch. Uh, Rome only because Peter and Paul um, suffered martyrdom, martyrdom there. So it always enjoyed a, a prestige of honor. Um, but uh, even uh, in Irenaeus' day, I mean, Pope Victor was it? Uh, the Pope, uh, pope Eleutherio, Eleutheros, 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 uh, was a Montanist. And so um, Irenaeus had to correct him, the Pope of Rome. Um, pope Victor was the, one, was the one that succeeded Eleutheros. And he, he uh, he launched this, uh, what was it called, the Easter controversy? Oh, yeah. Uh, Saint Saint, he was, uh, Saint, uh, Pope Victor was kind of a pugnacious, uh, you know, sergeant-type guy. He wanted it to be, he thought it should be this way, and he's going to impose his way in, on, on all the church. St. Irenaeus had to draw him back. He said, if you do this, you're going to rend the churches into pieces. So just back off. So he was able to, but the point is that, um, that Rome... Um, was not the um, it, it was it was not the um, the center of intellectual theological activity that Alexandria and Antioch were. So the reason that I, one reason this should be of interest to us is from Noah's presentation the last time. Um, um, Origen was in the third century. You wonder if he even knew about Saint Irenaeus. He had to, but I don't remember in Origen's writings him ever referring to Saint Irenaeus. Um, and St. Athanasius, I don't remember him ever referring to St. Irenaeus. And yet all the principles that were uh, in the debate in uh, St. Athanasius' critique of Origen 
They're all there in St. Irenaeus. Even creation out of nothing. Um, he makes that ex- explicit point on the apostolic preaching. His text on the apostolic preaching. His first chapter. That God creates from nothing. The things that were not, he made them to be. Um, and God, and, and it's very clear, he's, he, he, obviously this is not yet an issue in the early church, so he's not being as careful, he's not being like St. Athanasius to articulate it, uh, like, uh, you know, and spell it out like St. Athanasius did, but it's pretty clear from his writings that, uh, it would, that God created the world um, by his own free will, mm-hmm. not out of his essence, as Origen wanted to maintain. But it also makes me wonder, Cindy, if for the reason that Origen was hesitant about ascribing the creation of the world to the will of God, I wonder if it wasn't because he, he was afraid of the specter of Gnosticism. He might sound he might be promoting some kind of agnostic doctrine of creation. For the Gnostics, the world is created out of the psychological distress <laughs> of some of the gods. In other words, not out of their essence, but out of, the, out of their emotions. They were, they, there's this thing called the pleroma, and that's like heaven, where the divine beings live. And some of them got out of the pleroma and got in distress because they were separated from their buddies, and that's how the demiurge forms and this other stuff. It's and That's what creates the world, so that's right. why the world is a dark place. Right. Sophia, it, it's interesting too. There's news is one of them. Sophia yes, is yes, one. Yes, yes. Uh, it, uh, common names. The different groups have different names for their people, but uh, but sometimes they share them or they're the, s- the same name for different ones. It's like it's confusing. So the point that I was trying and starting to make is that uh, this is the time when the church is going out into the world and is having to confront all of these crazy ideas. Gnosticism was one of them, the syncretistic um, movement drawing together from everything um, around a common, uh, a common tenet, which is that the world is evil. But again, I'm wondering if the real drive and the real pull of ancient Gnosticism wasn't some kind of a sense of being disenfranchised. <clears throat> like I could it, see it being an existential, you know, it's the answering the question of, why am I here? Why am what's I here? The, what's Why is the world against me? Right. Why is it any other? Right. God doesn't love me. Oh, how well, guess what? The God that doesn't love me is the bad guy. But And it's through this period that the church is working to define itself. Yes, yes. And that's it's also point. trying to define itself not only against the Gnostics, but apart from the rabbinic Judaism that's starting to form. Yeah, so you can see what's happening is that St. Irenaeus, like all of the other apologists, they're forced by the circumstances to call together the fundamentals of the Christian faith and to pull together this canon, begin to articulate this canon. They didn't invent the canon, this canon of truth. They're pull, rather, they're pulling it together and they're giving it articulation, they're delineating it. Um, and as Cindy was indicating, uh, for St. Irenaeus... Uh, that canon of truth he's drawing from the scriptures. For him, the scripture, uh, and actually not only for St. Irenaeus, but even for the, the church at this time, the scriptures were the prophets. Moses, the prophets, the Psalms. They didn't even call it the Old Testament. No, it was just all the scriptures. They were called the scriptures. What's also interesting is that they did not refer to the Gospels as um, Gospels. At least Justin Martyr did not. He referred to them as memoirs. Memoirs of Jesus. <clears throat> All of this to indicate that for the early church here, the um, the, uh, the that it's, it's to say it's to, it to illustrate how the early church was how it um, rose out of the uh, the uh, how would you call it you know this this um, experience of salvation in Christ that was um, given concrete form in the sacraments. That also was in St. Irenaeus, and especially in his, on his apostolic preaching, where the faith, the faith of the church is not so much this message. There is a message. There's a proclamation. I mean, his, the, the text that I'm referring to is the proclamation of the apostolic preaching. But the faith 
is the um, articulation and also the articulation in praxis, Travis, of Christ's death and resurrection. And you receive this faith. You don't just believe it. You receive it like we did on Saturday, right, at the baptism. We didn't ask Emily, who's the sponsor for Lydia, all right, Emily, tell us what you believe. Like they do down the street over here. And just come and come as you are. Come, you can believe whatever you want to. I've, I've seen it in their advertisement. Come to us. Just, you can, just be, be, believe whatever you want to. We don't do that. <laughs> she received the faith of the church. But what did, what did that reception mean? How was it, how was it acted out? Um, it was acted out by actually bringing her to the font baptizing her and uniting her with Christ's death and resurrection, then chrismating her, putting on a new robe, right, and then bringing her to the Amvon and feeding her with Christ's body and blood. So that the faith that she received was acted out in her, and she entered into it. This is the faith that saves her, that saves us. Um, so that the... Uh, so what I'm saying is that the scriptures, you know, for the for the Saint Irenaeus and for the apologists of his day, and for the Orthodox Church to this day, the scriptures were the Old Testament. And the point is that Saint that Saint Irenaeus was proving that Christ was born of the Virgin, that he suffered and died on the third day, and that he did all of these miracles. He proved it all from the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. Yeah, he's referring to Isaiah, the Psalms. There's many different. Old well, you, you were saying you know, on Sunday, you know, Enoch, first Enoch, yeah. Baruch, 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 um, these, these intertestamental writings. Uh, so, I, so, I, so, I'm not, so, St. Irenaeus is in that second, third generation of the church, who is now going out into the world to proclaim the gospel, and what they're having to do in order to proclaim it to those who have never been part of the commonwealth of Israel, have no, no clue of what the Old Testament prophets are all about, having to proclaim to them and, and, and speak to them in their grammar. But somehow I figure out how to translate the grammar of the Bible, or of the Christian worship, into the grammar of philosophy and mythology and ancient religions. So this is, this is one thing that makes St. Irenae such a fascinating study. And uh, the, I think the point that I was driving at also when I was pointing out that he was in Lyon, which is way up here, you know, northwest of Rome. Antioch, Antioch is over here. Alexandria is over here. Uh, you know, get my directions right for you. All the activities down here, like Saint Irenaeus, is up there forgotten. I mean, who, who even knew about him? And yet here he is, like Cindy was saying, here he is, uh, proclaiming the the fundamentals of the faith in a right, you know, intelligent manner. And what he's saying is exactly what the church has been teaching all along. It's quite interesting. Uh, Paul? So I was just going to ask, so uh, if you were saying that they're sort of separated geographically, uh, and they're not referencing Irenaeus, so did that mean sort of that they weren't talking, that churches... Well, I think that they did well, I... Or, or yeah, I just mean like they weren't communicating very much. Yeah. I mean, or, there, was, there was this trade route between Marseille, did I say Marseille, and Lyon. Um, but... It's like, it's like, uh, what good can come out of Lyon? Why even pay attention to it? That's just way up there in the barbarians' country. I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm just thinking that. And we don't. I don't know if we know for sure if they had access to his writings. I mean, he did write them. Well, like in general, were the, yeah. the so like Antioch and Alexandria were probably communicating more, but so well, did yeah, this pray to yeah, all these guys around the Mediterranean, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, and he Rome. was probably sent by Antioch you know, sure. under that direction to go to Lyon. The next power that comes into play after Alexandria and Antioch still isn't Rome, it's Africa. Augustine. Tertullian. This northern Africa. I mean, still Rome enjoys a prestige of honor and always has because of Peter and Paul. That's where they died. But in terms of developing its, uh, its kind of authoritative the power... <coughs> that takes a few, a little while to develop. Uh, the, the, 
phrase that comes back to me with NRS is the fullness of the faith. Because I, th I think Gnosticism is pretty much a Christian phenomenon, right? I mean, it's well, a no, no, Christian David. heresy, isn't no, it? No. Did it, in, no. did it exist independent of yeah. the church? Yeah. It well, drew from the, Christianity. The sort of transcendentalism and dualism certainly yeah. did. But the particular Gnostic form of it, no. I think... There were several different Gnostic groups, and so some of them had familiarity or may have even come from a Christian yeah, background, yeah, like yeah, Valentinius. Christianity, yeah. Valentinius and um, Marxian uh, had a Christian background so or a Christian Gnostics understanding. Or they became Christians. Or even vice versa. But the Gnostic movement, if you want to call it that, was drawing from everybody. Orphix, Plato, Pythagoras. Yeah, Plato. Do, do also Just like the transcendentalists that you mentioned. Okay. So, but there were Christians. But see, see, there were Christians who were identified as Gnostics. The heresy is generally not something that's completely false. It's just taking one piece and dropping everything else. And just going crazy with that. They were picking and, and choosing. And then what Irenaeus did was, went, no, 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 no. You can't just take the dualistic piece or the transcendental piece and run into that. You have to have the whole of the Old Testament, the Creator God. You have to have all the other pieces in here. Or else you're going to go wrong. And you will go wrong. Well, you, yeah, you, you won't be saved. Yeah. Because save isn't... In, in, as Christians, as Orthodox Christians, what do we learn about ourselves? We're the first of all sinners. <laughs> That's what we learn. That's our knowledge. And that we're dead. We're dead as a doornail. You can believe whatever you want to believe, son. Congratulations. You believe in Jesus Christ? Way to go. You're still dead. You need to be raised from death to life in order to be saved. And how do you do that? Through faith. But not faith in believing in the message, getting back to the point I was making. Faith is this active reception of the mysteries of Christ's death and resurrection, not as a, not as a, a set of ideas that you believe, but as a reality that is made present today in the church, in her sacraments, in her liturgical worship. We're not just, we're not just you know, remembering Christ way back then. We're not just talking about Christ. Christ is in our midst now. It's not a mental ascent. It's a physical participation. It's a participation. That's how we are saved. That's how we're raised from death to life. So for us, baptism is not just a symbol. Right? You are actually entering into, you are uniting yourself with Christ in the likeness of his death and resurrection. That's the faith of the church. That's the faith that justifies us. The devil's belief doesn't do them a bit of good because they will not enter into the mystery of Christ's death and resurrection. Uh, River? Uh, with uh, with faith in the in the Bible and in the, in the, in the <clears throat> and in the church, do you think you could call that uh, trust in uh, in Christ? Is that oh, another would that be another way of phrasing that? Yes. Or yes. faithfulness. Add the ness in there. Yeah. But certainly, if I'm going to give myself to this this man who's dying on the cross, I got to have some trust in him. Yeah. But it goes deeper than that, even. Faith actually is the expression of one's love. There's the love of God for us, which is his faith to us, his faithfulness to us. And then we reciprocate. We love him who first loved us. That's what it is to believe him. To love him. And for us to love Christ is not, again, just to think nice thoughts about him. It's a marriage. We become one with Christ. There's a union, a marital union, a nuptial union. St. John Chrysostom calls the baptismal sacrament of the church, he calls it the, uh, the spiritual marriage of the church. And then the Eucharist is the marriage banquet. And then that garment that you put on after, when you're baptized, that's the wedding garment. But I'm, what, 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 what we begin to understand you know, with all of this is that you know, the church, the true church, <laughs> is not about Christ. She is the body of Christ. To receive the faith of the church is to receive the mystery of Christ's death and resurrection and to be incorporated 
into his body. That's what it is to be. In the, and that's what saves us. Not this gnosis. But the, what, what, what's interesting is, okay, this is faith, faith and is not, faith is, is rooted in obedience. Right? It's, it's not rooted in knowledge. It's rooted in obedience. And through this obedience, which we practice by following the commandments of Christ, through this obedience, we are united with Christ, we, and then we are taught the way of Christ, which again, in the church, is what? It's descending with the mind into the heart. And there in the heart, the bridal chamber now, transfigured by Christ's death and resurrection, from the tomb into the bridal chamber, now the heart is where the mind feeds on Christ and becomes wise in the wisdom of God, not in the wisdom of men. So um, there is gnosis. There is gnosis in the, new t in the, in the church. And St. Paul is using that word gnosis all over the place. That's why St. Irenaeus says, this is, this is against the Gnostics who are falsely called Gnostics. Because they're not, their gnosis is of their own invention. Or it's Valentinus's <coughs> invention. And even, they might go so far as to say that it's not even Valentinus's own invention. It's from the devil. Um, let's see. But somewhere it says um, that these uh, Gnostics were called the um, offspring the, uh, of, uh, of the serpent. They're like the hydra. Hydra, was that the hair of Minerva, or whatever her name was? That's Medusa. 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 The, 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 these snakes going out of Medusa's head, those are the Gnostics. They're all from the serpent. So in other words, they have this, Gnosticism, this mindset, has a spiritual root. But it's not the spirit of God. So you, now you get St. John's epistle, right? Test the spirits to see if they are of God. Those that confess, the spirit that confesses that Jesus is the Christ is the Son of God. Well, to say that he's the Christ is to say that God became flesh. You said uh, that, there were, that the incarnation began at the uh, baptism for the Gnostics. Technically, there was no incarnation. Right. Yeah, there's no incarnation. That was just a man that the spirit, that the, that the eon or whatever joined himself to for a time, used him as a mouthpiece, and then when, I'm, I'm not going to suffer. So as soon as they get Jesus on the cross, I'm out of here. But I don't have to suffer because your salvation doesn't depend on you suffering with Christ. Your salvation depends on accepting this message that I've given you and that you are, in fact, a God. You know, I'm calling to that divine spark in you. Well, that divine spark, that comes from Plato. Plato gets it from other places also. So that, that, that again, speaks to the syncretism of, of this Gnostic movement, this and I think it's fascinating, David, you know, to, to see that this is still, I, I, I'm, fast, uh, I'm fascinated with the examples that you, that you raised from Metropolitan Rome. You know, that's, <laughs> it's alive and well. You know, I was thinking, um, you know, my wife and I, and many of you, we grew, up in the, we grew up in the church where, you know, God is talking to people all the time. That looks to me an awful lot like the Gnostic spirit. So what do these people do when this person gets a message? My favorite story to illustrate this point, uh, we had a, I had a fan, friend, his name is Cameron, and he fell in love with a girl named Minnie. We were sophomores in college at the time. She had just broken up with her old boyfriend. Cameron started dating her, and he fell in love with her. So he asked her to marry him. So I think she may have said yes. Then she kind of backed off, and she said, you know, after a month or two of being unofficially engaged or whatever, she says to him, you know, Cameron, um, God told me that um, you're not the one. Cameron looks at her, and he says, what? That's odd. You didn't tell me that. <laughs> the Gnostic, Gnostic spirit is alive. Other questions? Uh, Travis? On some level, could you say that almost all heresies or all sins are a misdirection of the desire for theosis? I would say that. I would say that. You don't have to, but I would say that. You know, on that note, thinking back to Noah's presentation all the last two weeks, 
um, and anticipating what uh, Cindy would say, I'm thinking that we could perhaps uh, illustrate the, the, you know, because what Cindy's talking about with St. Irenaeus, what you were talking about with St. Athanasius and the concept of creation, they're saying pretty much this, they're, they're saying the same thing. They're making the same points. Um, and I'm thinking that maybe we could um, help us to understand um, all that's at stake and all that's coming um, through in these, um, in these um, uh, conflicts uh, with the Gnostics, uh, the origin, is uh, if, we could, if we just provide drawing a simple graph, an iconograph. And uh, we'll just start right here. The iconograph is this line. And that's it. On this side, as we did with the null, we'll put the uncreated. On this side, we'll put the created. Now, I asked Noah, on which side in Origin's system would you place the world? Remember what you said? Uncreated. Yeah, the world's up here, on, on the uncreated. Cindy, in the Gnostic system. It's created. Yeah, you've got, now you have the creation, don't you? Yeah. But what if you're one of the elect? that divine spark that's in you. You have a spiritual component. No, but you have an, uh, you are, you are uncreated. Okay. So you have in the Gnostic system, basically you're up here too. Okay. And what's happened is that you have fallen into the creation. Yes. Okay. Now you gotta that's the, and that's why they would also use the term emanation for the yeah. aeons as opposed to begotten or... And this is not created by God. Right. This is created by the demiurge. Yeah. The bad God. And so it's a prison house. Here you can see Orphism. You know, the roots of Orphism are way back. And you're trying to escape from this prison house. Um, but um, if you, 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 maybe not you, but you, <laughs> If you, ha if you are this God in you, then you're on this side, on the uncreated. If you're not, well, good. No, sorry. I'm stuck in created prison, yep. time is dragging on. <laughs> yep. So enjoy it while you can. Uh, either enjoy it or... So the question is, um, if I'm on this side, um, what will be my destiny if my final destiny, my perfected destiny. If this is where I originate, what will be my perfected destiny relative to the God, the One, the highest supreme being? You'll dissolve into the yes, One. Yes, you dissolve into the One. Uh, the source that I read uh, says, that, you know, uh, refi describes Gnosticism as um, uh, various forms of monism uh, interwoven with different kinds of dualisms. But the dualism is what's created out of the anguish of whatever goddess or eon it was that from whom, uh, Sophia in some of them you know, that created the world. Okay. So um, now let's go to the uh, Christian system real quickly. Uh, the upshot of St. Irenaeus and the upshot of St. Athanasius um, is this. Who's on this side? Noah? God. I'm being created. God as? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all up here. Where is everything else, including angels, which was part of our reading today? Created. Everything's down here. God is the creator of everything, visible and invisible. So this is the created world. It includes everything visible and invisible. The world, man, everything. If that's the case, what's our relationship to the uncreated? We're created. What's our relationship to the created? Uncreated. Ontologically, how are we going to uh, how are we going to even know about the uncreated? Revelation. All right, revelation. So far, so good. Um, we're still with the Jews. And we're still with the Muslims. Um, but now, where did you originate? You're created. But what was the vessel, if you will, the receptacle in which you were created? Nothing. No? Nothing. You 
created from nothing, but you are created from within something. You say from God, which person of the Godhead? The Son. Where's the Son? The Father. Who's up here? And yeah. Uncreated. Yeah. So you're created, but this is this is this is to blow your mind. You originate beyond yourself, outside of yourself, in the uncreated. You did not exist before you were created. Understand, you did not exist, but you were known by God before you existed. So your origin is up here. Your ecstatic origin. Your ecstatic, ecstasis. Ek, away from, stasis, to stand. So to stand away, you, you, you come into being ecstatically. Your origin is from outside of yourself, it's beyond yourself. But you are a created being. How on earth are you going to... Um, oh, so let's let me back up. So, so if salvation is to believe the word of God that is given to you, that is revealed to you from up here, if that's what salvation is, well, what is the content of salvation? I know that's a wide open question. I'm sorry. Um, but do your best. <laughs> What would, be, would it, would it be, um, it, it's, it's believing in the message, right? That would be salvation, to believe in the message. What would be the message? Well, it could be a number of anything. It could be that God is, uh, hear, O Israel, God, your, God, your God is one. Uh, him alone shall you worship. Okay, but if you're, so if you're obeying the message or the word that has come to you by revelation, um, uh, what's your relationship to the one, to God? You're still separate. You're still separated, exactly. There's still this wall. That's the point. But what if one of the three persons descended and clothed himself in our humanity? Now what we have? We have Christ, who in his inner identity is uncreated, he's God, from everlasting to everlasting. But he clothes himself in our humanity. So now we have a link to the uncreated. And that link is Jesus Christ. What now is salvation? Is it Jesus telling us a message? Because remember, we're created. We're not uncreated. We're not, there's no, there. There's no divine spark in us. There's a divine image. There's a divine likeness. There's a capacity to receive God. But there's no divine spark. And if you want to talk about a divine spark, well, you have, to, you have to nuance it. You have to be careful that you're saying it in the right context. We're not saying that you are God by nature. So now what is salvation? Communion. Communion. It's being united with the uncreated. Is there any other way to be united with the uncreated than through the uncreated God, the only begotten God, he's called in St. John, who clothed himself and united himself to us? So you see that salvation now is not just believing that God did this or that for me. It's actually uniting myself church, which is his body. Again, it's not a, the church is not this organization that talks about God. The church is the body of Christ. Paul? What's to stop that uh, scheme from being flipped around? Why can't the created access the divine if the divine can access the created? Well, now we can. Well, I'm saying prior to, if we say there's no incarnation, uh, if the divine could, in theory, access createdness, what is the reason why it can't go the other way? I don't if, I don't see how it could. It's okay. uncreated. It's altogether beyond me. It's the invisible realm. How are you going to get there? Or look at it this You're way, physical. Cindy. You're dead. You're a corpse. What corpse do you know can raise itself from death to life? See. But Remember. he says he is the way, he is the gate, he is the door, he's all the... That's, the he's, he's the, the gate. bridge. He, he, but here's the point. We were created. This is why I bring this up. We were created in his image. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. 
Christ is the image of the invisible God. And then the Holy Fathers would go from here. There's another passage also that talks about Christ as the icon of the invisible God. Well, there's uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Um, also talks about Christ as the icon. Um, that this, that Christ did, is the icon in whom we were created. And then the Holy Fathers, uh, from maybe the time of origin on, uh, in order to bring out this point, when they talk about man, they will talk about man as uh, the, the image in the image, or the image of the image. Um, and then, you know, so that, that was uh, Origen's beautiful phrase was uh, the primary essence of human nature, of our being, is that we were created according to the image and likeness of God. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful little statement. He's, he's in this philosophical <coughs> environment at the time where the, uh, one of the burning questions was, what are we? Are we air, fire, earth? Um, are we a, a water? Are we a combination of the, th of the four elements? Um, are we some kind of immaterial spirit? Just what are we? So Origen comes along, and now he's articulating this, this preaching of the church. And he's, sp he's speaking in the grammar of... Uh, here, I think he's successfully translating the grammar of the Bible into the grammar of philosophy. And he's saying, our primary essence is not a what. Our primary essence actually is a relationship. We exist in our fundamental, our fundamental essence is to be in relationship with God or be in communion with God. Got it? Well, I was going to say, and we see that borne out by the experience of humanity because no matter where we go, we're always relating with some spiritual force. There you go. Like, yeah. look at the pagans. They didn't just, you know, they, they related to their spirits deliberately, but in the modern world, we're still relating with spirits all the uh -huh. time. No, I think you're right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Didymus the Blind of Alexandria, he was a disciple of Origen. He, he's, on the, he's the next century, he's the next generation. Um, he, he carries Origen's uh, investigation, if you will, his contemplation further, and he asks, what then, what, what is the essence of the image that we're created? You know, the image of God according to which our primary essence exists. And he said, oh, it is the capacity to receive God. That's what it is to be human. It's to be in communion with God, and it is to exist in this capacity to receive God and become one with God. So you see, reality, a salvation, is not just believing that Jesus died for my sins. Yeah, he did that. But again, the devils believe that too. To be saved in the church is to become is to enter into that mystery through the sacraments of the church. That's what the sacraments are not symbols. Well, they are symbols if you go with the Greek. They are coming together of two realities: the reality of heaven, the reality of earth, the reality of the spirit, the reality of the earth, the reality of God, the reality of man. And in that union, in that symbol, where the two come together, God becomes man, and we become God. God becomes man without ceasing to be God. This is the great mystery. We become God without ceasing to be man. But we become one with God. And now, Christ is all in all. <coughs> He's the whole shebang. And he even embraces hell. Because he's filled it with his light. Michael? Yeah, uh, a lot of the Christians uh, reject the sacraments. Couldn't we call that kind of a semi um, a Gnostic position? Because they reject, they, they, they don't say they're necessarily bad, but you don't, they're optional. You know, if you get baptized, that's great if you want or to do that. Or is it just that they're heterodox? <laughs> or, or could it actually be that they're accurately, accurately perceiving that their sacraments don't have grace? Well, it's just. Do you just believe that it's all it's, it really matters? You believe the right thing, and if you want to do those things that they help you, it's fine. But you don't really need to. So no, it's kind I, of like I, not I've totally come, gnostic. But just, kind of, no, I, I wouldn't say it's gnostic necessarily. It could yeah. be, but not necessarily. It's more adoptionist. It's more of an adoptionist. In other words, it's teaching that Jesus was just a man, 
mm -hmm. who was in a special relationship with God. Look at that. He's just a man who's in a special relationship with God. He's not the God incarnate. God is just kind of in a relationship with him through some kind of grace. But God does not actually become incarnate. So there's still the separation between God and man. So why mean? do you need the sacraments? You don't need them. Is that necessarily implied? If, if somebody dispenses with the sacraments, is it necessarily implied that they have to be adoptionists then? Or is it no, they could be other things. But they would be some variety of, of heretic, Gnostic. But it would necessarily mean that they are denying the incarnation. Okay. That's necessarily. So, so if someone means. doesn't believe baptism uh, unites someone to Jesus Christ in his death, and well, right. okay. then we say, well, then you didn't believe in the incarnation properly. Um, yeah, but even then I would nuance it according to what Travis was saying, because you, you might be saying the truth with regards to your baptism. So we would say, but yeah, your baptism doesn't. Yeah, but don't tell me what does. our baptism is. Oh, you're not okay. even Orthodox. We'll tell you what it is. But if they deny our baptism, yeah, then... No, that's, they... Yeah, you're going too far. Okay. In fact, I'm with Travis. You, I'll believe what it... I'll, I'll, I'll give you what you say yours is. Because I think you're speaking from your own experience. And my own experience <laughs> in a church that was not sacramental, I wanted to believe that these were sacraments, that this was, in fact, the body and blood of Christ. I couldn't, though, because it was so casual... <laughs> grape juice and crackers. There's no way this could be the body and blood of Christ. I wanted it to be, though. But if I had taught that from the pulpit as a Nazarene pastor, I'd have been going upstream, and I wouldn't have lasted more than a month. Because that's, that's, that's not the belief of the Nazarenes. I did get my friend in trouble, because we read John 6 together. I had never read it. We read it together, and then he w was like an assistant pastor at this church, and he goes up there, and he's talking. Uh, on the one week we do communion, he's given a little sermon. And so then he starts blabbing about John 6, and he got a bunch of nasty yeah. comments. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? It goes to Cindy's point with St. Irenaeus. Your pastor friend is quoting the Bible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was like 653, what's your problem? you know, just directly quoting it, and people got really upset. Yeah, what's your problem? Uh, and and that, that same gospel goes on, doesn't it say? that many of them were, did not like what he was saying, and many stopped following him at that point. <coughs> Very thorough passage. He uh, goes over all so. the... I'd say so. All the objections. I'd say so. Well, you know, um, um, this is, I'm not surprised that, that this conversation <coughs> has pretty much centered on this one topic, because we still haven't, you know, we haven't done our stoops, we haven't uh, done our highlighted passages, but this is what I'm thinking. Um, we began this experiment not really knowing what to expect. We were proposing how we were going to set it up, and uh, my fear, uh, what I was trying to protect against, was that we would have a bunch of empty space, and we'd just be sitting around the table looking at each other. So I wanted to make sure we had enough content. But no, we have plenty of content. And just reading um, the assigned passages for this evening, not to mention the last three, four weeks, um, I think we have enough content just from for tonight that we could have spent two hours just sharing what um, you highlighted and talking about it, you know, and, and using that as a platform for our discussion in the same way that we used Cindy's paper on St. Irenaeus as a platform for this evening's discussion. So um, unless, I mean, honestly, um, you know, as I say, uh, we're not going for a degree. Um, there's no requirements that we're having to, to satisfy for me to, to say that you passed and now this, you know, the organization can say that you have satisfied the requirements for this class. We can go at our own pace. Uh, we can go as the, uh, as the uh, class just naturally goes. And I'm thinking, why don't we just um, go next Monday, why don't we do what the assignment was for tonight? I mean, unless somebody feels... Instead of, is there a presentation? Yeah. There is the presentation, yes. Who's the presentation? St. Athanasius. St. Athanasius. Who has St. Athanasius? Who has Saint Athanasius? Well, that was you, Noah. Yeah. That, you just, you already did that. No. He did Florosky. What's that? Did you did Florosky. Okay. Um, I, I don't have it in front of me. Who is, is the, is the St. Athanasius the father? Yeah. November 18th, St. Athanasius, there he be. I don't know who did St. Athanasius. 
I have to look at my notes. I got it somewhere. I'll look. Ah, uh, Saint Simeon. Well, maybe the one who's doing Saint Athanasius is not able to be here this evening. Yeah. All right. Uh, you know, we can we can punt easily. Oh, if yeah. a presenter doesn't come. We've well, got plenty of stuff to yes. talk about. Just Be ready to put on the table what your highlighted text is. Do you want us to do the reading for next week? Or? Well, you, you know, you may. Okay. Here's the thing. My concern, my, my, my hope, my wish is that, uh, you know, you could, you could uh, read through all of Pomazansky and Harmonk uh, Gregorius and John of Damascus, and you'd have a nice, solid uh, deposit of, of theological understanding. But, and that's very valuable. But I don't see that we have to um, rush the, the class discussion uh, at the same pace. Uh, we can uh, slow down and we can talk about these points. I mean, just, just, just the reading for this evening, the three texts. I, I myself have all kinds of notes that I'd, like, I'd, love, to, I'd love to share. And I'm guessing that you do too. And um, uh, we can either get a superficial um, overview, kind of flyover understanding of theology, or if, you death, if that's what you want, you can read the text, and then in class, we'll go into more depth. That's my, that's my thought. It also means then that you're, you, you know, it, it kind of takes the burden off of all of us, not just you, but also on me. My time is, is limited too. So is my stamina. So I have to observe, I have to honor my limitations as well. If that's satisfactory, of course, I, you, know, you can object maybe after class. <laughs> You're too bashful to object here. But otherwise, that's what we'll do. You can read on if you'd like, otherwise. Um, maybe read the sections again. Uh, review the text that you highlighted and maybe put your thoughts together more, co more coherently, if you wish. And we'll use that as a platform for our discussion next week. All right. Shall we stand and close with that? Really did meet, bless you, fair Gopos, ever blessed and most pure, and the mother of our Lord, more honorable than the cherubim, and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without corruption, dost thou give birth to God the Lord. True, fair Gopos, we magnify thee. Christ is in our midst. He is in our shall be.